Okay, hello everyone. Hopefully my voice is loud and clear. Okay. Projected paradigms of parallel selfhood. In tonight's ep episode, I wanted to, uh, in some sense, focus on the subtler uh, subjective existence. Uh, I have often said that behind our eyes, there is a permission for abstract phenomenon to move that in front of our eyes, we cannot find it. And our imagination appears to us. Is this on? Yeah. <clears throat> and our and our imagination appears to us. At most, as an observable phenomena, a subjectively observable phenomena. There is a room of matter you're in, and then there is a room of thoughts. Now, man is thinking he's a thought. Everybody is working uh, with a sort of parallel selfhood. As you are in this moment, you're wondering about who you were. You're wondering about who you will be. Eventually, you will have to consider a moment that is uh, either from now or um, the, v the future will direct your attention to a different self. Now... I find that behind the eyes of the person, there will come moments where any sort of abstraction held in attention, that means if I tell you to imagine something, there has to be a sort of space to imagine it in. The space behind your eyes, there requires a witnessing stillness to be able to consider something other than itself. There's a song I'm trying to find before I get into this. Um, there we go. There is no one self, everybody. Uh, the per individual is functioning by it's a spectrum, a hierarchy, a sort of uh, environment that the individual is being identified in. If the environment doesn't permit individuality, there would be no individual in some sense. What that means is if the ground underneath our feet changed much quicker than we did, in some sense, we would not have a place to stand. Similarly, sometimes the inner reality moves at a speed that the outer reality cannot relate to. When that happens, there comes a nostalgia from a collective rhythm. That means you feel as if the winds are moving above your head, not through you. This notion of parallel selfhood has two sides like a coin. It has one side where it is elusive. You have to be able to acknowledge the void before you enter into those unknown fields. And similarly, there's a part of it which has to be consciously known. So as if you have to be aware and inside your vehicle, and as you navigate it in any sort of road, there is an awareness to not just the space outside of your vehicle, but how the space inside the vehicle is so crucial, how you handle the inner space to handle the external space. They, they are linked at some point. You're going to see a lot of
a lot of subjectivity is held by objectivity. The moment the objectivity goes, the subjectivity will be empty. <clears throat> what does that mean? That means you look at a object and you name this object. You know, let's say right now in front of me, there is a cup, you know, a plastic cup. Now this cup, I, a part of me knows that when the pot, when the cup, um, <clears throat> In accordance in, in relation to its manifest quality when it com is completely destroyed the concept of the cup remains but the cup is no longer here That's a very important idea. Objectivity changes, but the subjectivity stays. What are our memories? They are the subjective phenomena of a certain moment that has remained with us. And this sort of subjective life is crucial to study now because the human being is being limited by its language. Pretty much there's two dimensions that if the person can get comfortable with, their true work can begin. Um, a concept which I, I would speak about it in earlier talks, I think ranging from 200 to 300. Uh, I was speaking about it more, but um, I, I think I should speak about it again. It's this notion of the great work. The great work is not per se an alchemical uh, concept. It's a concept that means in your lifetime, there is a sort of energetic uh, capability, a sort of reservoir of energetic being. And this energetic being once realizes that you can only live for the self for a certain amount of your life. Afterwards, you're going to see how important the world is for that self you want to remain. Kind of like the king realizing that it requires its kingdom to feel like a king. You know, we have had many kings in history who they either deserved the chair or did not deserve the chair. And whether that chair was the throne or the executioner's uh, kind of chair. <clears throat> Life has to be lived ultimately. It has to be lived because there are unknown dimensions to it that won't open up until you act in accordance to at least a certain pattern. When I say projected paradigms of parallel selfhood, I mean literally it's a model where we are, it's as if it's a new subjective vehicle where the human consideration is considering various senses of self. You see in front of your eyes, you look in the mirror, you see one body, you see oneself. Okay, that's the very, that's the simple. You know, that's the easy way of seeing the self, you know. Now, when you look in the mirror, something doesn't reveal something. Your face is seen. You can see your face. You can even see what's behind yourself in the mirror. But you cannot see the one who is looking out through your eyes. That means there is no objective value that can contain as how a sort of subjective phenomena is alive. So the thing was, it's kind of like I, 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 can't, I see the evolution of my thought to, in, in this manner. May, hopefully I can explain it well here. First, it was eyes open. There is a program. Go with the program. You go with the program and eventually you see the program doesn't have access to your inner program. To your inner approach. The value of the human mind is priceless because it determines the price. Our minds are not just sort of fixed values. They are also value givers. That's why I say the, your moment is world generation at infinitum. Do you know how many worlds are just occurring simply by the attention moving upon them?
Now, what to do when the world becomes multidimensional? You acknowledge the singular first of all. All dimensions have simple roots. When you understand this, it doesn't matter where in, 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 in manifestation, whether internal or external, you're thrown. It's as if the first thing is just see what is here. You, you let the first wave of data to settle in. What that means is you, you, you let yourself lose one battle. As you let yourself lose one battle, you get a sense. You get a sense of the battlefield. And then more there will come efforts uh, more in alignment with how the environment moves. You see, it's kind of like I found the greatest generals on the battlefield. Their intelligence was not. It's like when you read Sun Tzu, The Art of War, there's something very profound that even though it was war, even though it was uh, a game of death, it was at the same time he was seeking balance between heaven and earth, you know. This was the very profound concept that they, the, 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 the leaders of ancient times were not the only, they acknowledged there was the presence of a living world. Now we have made the world inanimate, you know, so we can be able to define it and control it. You know, that's the easiest thing, you know. You cut the value um, and then that system becomes dependent on... Uh, Okay, I'm not explaining this properly. Let me think. <laughs> Let me see if there's a better way to explain what I'm saying. <clears throat> think of it this way. You're not the first person to open your eyes in this world. All those people who lived before us, all those people who have sculpted our history, uh, there was a value to their design. And that value was decided once it tested the pass of uh, it. It passed the test of nature. You know that's how. That's why the words of Socrates uh, reach our ears. He saw something that was in alignment with nature's truth. You know. Nature has a voice that is not uh, in language. It, it, is, it, is, it is a voice of your presence. There is this incredible story. I'm going to share it. There's this man who is so lazy so hopeless he feels life has no meaning and he's just sitting in a corner waiting for it to end <clears throat> now i don't remember what happens but something happens where he decides to go to nature and he starts walking in nature in this forest and he sees he witnesses something divine he sees there is a wolf without legs sitting under a tree the wolf has no limbs and the man goes into shock because he's like, how is this wolf alive? How is this wolf alive? In this story, this guy's tripping out. He's like, how is this wolf without legs alive? And he just waits there to watch. And he eventually sees this lion in the story. This lion brings this wolf food. And the lion leaves. It leaves the weak wolf. And this man is like, oh my God, the universe has given me a message. I know what to do. And the guy runs in the street and now he has become a beggar. <laughs> He's like, oh my God, I am like the wolf. You know, if I just go and beg in some sense. And the guy goes and the guy goes and begs and nobody gives him anything. <laughs> and the guy is sitting there in a sort of sorrow. Again, the kind of existential chaos visits him. And he's there, he's wondering, and suddenly a sage is walking by. And the man sees the sage and he runs and he says, sage, he explains the whole thing to him, the whole ordeal of what he saw in nature and tells the sage, what was this sign? What was this unique thing that I saw? And the sage says, this was your error, that you thought, <clears throat> Do 
The sage says you thought you had to be the wolf, but actually life was showing you to be the lion. That's the unique moral of the story. The guy extracted a weak archetype just because the world was allowing it, you know? You don't know how many images of self come to one and leave, you know? And some people think it becomes the, I find the mystical kind of task is one where you renounce your attack. Sorry guys, there's an important phone call I gotta answer, just hold on a second. Okay, guys. Uh, all right, I'm back. I just had to answer that. <clears throat> to be honest, it's um, words are painting subjective landscapes on an empty piece of paper. We consider that the child is born with an empty mind, an empty slate. But its environment becomes its personality. That means from as a long period of an evolution dependent on something, then suddenly a sort of independence has arose. That's what our consciousness is, as an independence, an unconditional relationship with uh, nature's law. Sorry guys, I'm just going to finish giving the talk and then uh, um, I'd be very open to, at the end of it, engage with the chat section. The thing is, speech, like painting, it's, it's one of those things where you, you start off with structure and then as you wonder, as you um, self-inquire about the structure, the structure doesn't go away. It breaks a little bit, but then it becomes dynamic. And then life becomes rhythmic. And you can also get lost in the rhythms of nature too. Do you know? This is why there was a crucial uh, need for the mystic and the yogi. And <clears throat> I call the modern yogi the advanced communicator. Is that the advanced communicator becomes aware of how the communication is not just from the free will. You see, our free will exists behind our eyes. If the inner reality can observe the outer reality's voice. It's fascinating. The world is clothed in stories and we have linearized these stories in space and time only to realize that our access to phenomena is momentary. That means something very hilarious. You know, you'll notice the reason they say when you're having f time flies by when you're having fun is because your attention is not on time. It's on the activity. <laughs> I was raised in an um, Islamic environment when I was really young, like se till the age of seven. <coughs> and the Islamic context, the idea of heaven, hell, earth, all this was uh, familiar to me by that age. It's like you cannot avoid what the, the secrets of the environment that the body language of people share. Even if you don't know thought, you'll see it's like an idea enters their mind and it's suddenly there. Just like a substance, they become solid or liquid or they become like gas, you know, it's like they change state. 
that means language can change the state of the being because it directs the attention. <clears throat> and believe it or not, the concept of magic was actually the, how language was starting to come into civilization. People suddenly realized, the magicians realized so many people had no idea uh, that language could direct and shape and the most important thing, limit the realm of the person. This is why um, the human being, it doesn't matter who you are, never likes being lied to, you know? Somebody who likes being lied to who probably doesn't care, is a, is a bigger liar himself, you know? <laughs> Michelangelo said, I saw the angel in the stone and I set it free. So we are kind of seeing a world and we are setting free a design, a model for it. We are projecting or extracting or responding to whatever you like to call it to some sort of stimulus and that's becoming our meaning. Now, if we assume meaning is like a picture that you hang on the wall, then there's a issue there. It's as if it's, it's too solid, it's going to break through time. It's as if the issue, the problem of worshipping a fruit, imagine 100% there must have been someone in history who worshipped a fruit. You know, <laughs> the guy tasted oranges for the first time. I was like, oh my God, this orange is a God, you know. <laughs> but that person would see in time, it will leave. Sri Ramana Maharshi, this yogi, meets Papaji, this young, young guru. And Papaji is on the mountain of Arunachala and, and I don't know, he's engaged with something. And Ramana Maharshi goes up to him and says, what are you doing, kid? You know, <laughs> and Papaji looks at him and he says, I am dancing with Krishna. I am dancing with God. God has come to me. I'm dancing with God. You know, and she, Ramana Maharshi was like, OK, buddy. <laughs> no, she, Ramana Maharshi looked at him and said something very profound that liberates, liberated Papaji. And he says to Papaji, a God that comes and goes is not the real God. That's how powerful the mind is. It can become a creature. It can become your reflection. Parallel selfhood. This is a concept where I think it needs to be brought to life more. And I'm not sure how to do it because um, I get I have very limited in, in interpretation. Like, how can I say it? I, I don't see um, as far as I want to. But, but, but I have a sense that the mainstream acknowledges at least multidimensionality, not in accordance to the character. So what that means is we say, like, the character in the story is an objective, biological, evolving animal. Okay. So this is where, as far as the character's evolution goes, we stop it right there. It's as if you're no longer anything else. You're just this biology or this uh, objective. You are the objective. <clears throat> Matter defines the subjective realm. Okay, that's, that's how we are. Um, the concept of an animal lives on in our minds. Okay, just like the story I said earlier, the guy realized he could have been the wolf, he could have been the lion. Pretty much in any moment you can identify with any aspect of it, you can um, literally like clay um, mold it into whatever belief you want. But my relationship with images is no longer one where the image defines me, I wait for the images to come.
you know it's as if you you chase something for so long eventually you realize you're chasing something that's not even external and you have this loud laugh that um we are limited to some degree to the story of matter but at the same time the the imagination exists for a reason for a reason beyond reason our reasoning is limited to the observable universe. If there's more than the observable universe, then our reason becomes limited to. And pretty much it's, it comes down, at least when it comes for living for your civilization, for your species, for this four billion year old science project, you know. If life wasn't temporary, if our bodies were not temporary, <clears throat> I would have nothing to say. But only because they are temporary, that means a sort of value has opened its eyes for a certain time. This value has two problems, one of its inner constitution and its outer constitution. The outer constitution, if you, if you are not aware of the inner constitution, it's like you don't, you don't have time to handle. It's as if you are not in the battlefield, you have gone, um, it's like life still needs to teach you about the self uh, before yourself awakens to uh, what it's codependent to, which is the world. So behind your eyes is, is a space where you can become the world. You can identify as such a moment of mind where the body is similar to every other thought. You can step out of the room of any ideology. But more important than that is listening to your true nature and believe it or not, this is going to sound hilarious, but <clears throat> there was a time I had a um, personal trainer, uh, this Persian guy named Hamid. <laughs> and I asked him very directly and I'm like, hey, man, what is it? You know, like, what's the best approach? And he's like, listen to your body. Right. That's what he said, you know, and the same wisdom found me when I went to the mystical and it was constantly listen to what is happening and I notice why why this constant need to renounce the world because really the person doesn't know if it's the world they're seeing or it's their world they're seeing so that's why renunciation was said was said generally this is why they have to discipline was required to an intense degree you know <clears throat> Papaji this um uh, the student of Sri Ramana Marshi, he said he wore a military outfit and he would go march into these temples as an authority, as a military authority to kind of stop. It's like he was looking for the truth that he didn't care for the personality of truth, you know. And he said it in one of his talks, he was saying that this man, Papaji, he stopped that search when he came to this idea that said God cannot be seen with these eyes. It's not something to be seen. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine how many people have given their life to wonder about the ultimate state of reality? They have sacrificed everything, you know, and only come to the conclusion that it is not something visible to the to that uh, egoic uh, construct, that archetype of selfhood. I tend to feel that the one's imagination must be kept like a still pond, as if kind of like in chess, you should start. It, it's like a way of not being the first, not taking the first move, not being, for example, the white pieces.
you know, you watch, you watch how the movement was and then you respond. Your strategy is not, at first it is structured, it's planned, but eventually you adjust it to what's happening. <clears throat> kind of like many businesses, they start off with a business model as they go into uh, the active environment, they begin to see they have to readjust their model to what's winning. So believe it or not, after it, it's not just money people are seeking in order to get money, they're seeking the winning strategy. The winning strategy has to include more data, kind of like how Albert Einstein said, you can't solve a problem with the same level of consciousness that created it. That means literally like you can't find the answer to a problem if you keep looking at the problem and see the same problem, you know? I find that <clears throat> no being can lie to itself. I feel you cannot hide what you are. Uh, and what you are is not per se a sort of thought, you know. We are living in an era where vision is more important than belief. What we see, what we actually see is actually here in this planet is more important than all the linguistic simulations and the programs of language in people's minds. You see language, the first thing I, I kind of acknowledge is that the species has to get acquainted. This is, this is where we, we as a species, speech-wise, we get to a point where language is... Um, Like the ancient Greeks, it becomes an art form. And in art, the image dictates the structure. That means the artist uh, on judgment day will have a different judgment because the artist paid attention to the unknown but didn't abide by it. It at least saw the unknown, you know? <laughs> It's as if the artist goes on judgment day and a voice says, why did you do what you do, what you did? You know, and the artist says, my actions were, were colored by the paint rush in the hand of the creator. So you see, you cannot judge on, to some degree, you know. Um, thanks for clarifying that, Idris. Yeah, he was definitely, he had access to a military uniform, you know. <laughs> now, here's the cool thing about all this. I, I consider a sort of technique and design to be superior to any sort of belief. And this technique and design is, if you choose to hold on to any past, It will be impossible to change it because you're holding on to it too. So the past is something where we have to either be a part of and change <clears throat> or we let the past do its thing. The past is like a senior citizen who has done their service to humanity and now must be ultimately respected by the mind of the civilization. So if you can't change the past, you know, the least you can do is at least accept it. Let it be what it's trying to be. And then we pause that and we create a parallel dimension where we totally start a new reality. You see, the cool thing about parallel realities is you can build many smaller rooms in one room.
It's very fascinating. It's like when you, if you were to look outside, you see the sky, the endless sky, you see, you see um, the material universe. And you also see, like, of course, scientifically, at least cl cl classic Newtonian um, physics, it's like they, they saw reality like a room. Right. And so we are creating set smaller rooms in our mind as subjects upon this. Sometimes when you treat the phenomena, the subjective phenomena, as if it's a room you're in, you can you can get out of it instantly. But if you define with the phenomena, well, guess what? As long as the phenomena happens, you happen. I kind of feel like another way I can um, ask the question is that whose orders, uh, um, whose command must the individual consciousness listen to? If the command is coming from the known, then we have access to how the design will happen. If it's coming from the unknown, either we create the design. It's very strange. It's like on some level, I wonder if anything new can ever happen because even if it happens, it has to live in an environment with so many ancient interpretations. To be honest, we have to develop new laws for the mind. The mind is, it's like we are just, just like Frodo who was about to take a step um, beyond the Shire. Similarly, we are, I think this is, this is the situation. Eight billion creatures evolve to a degree that they have minds that are, appear unknown to them in accordance to like what they act as if there's a sort of life to this world, this part of the world at least. And causing... <clears throat> A sort of design, you know. Something, something in, in ancient times they noticed. It's like based on what the guy's profession was. When you asked them, he saw his metaphysics, his mythology in a similar way. You asked the blacksmith what God, uh, the blacksmith kind of worshipped. And the good blacksmith would say Thor, bro. You know, <laughs> various, various archetypes, you know, various ways that design is being made animate. You can say how man considers um, divinity. I think divinity is always the witness of the subjective and objective being simultaneous. That's like an unknown space. So it's like we have to explore the unconscious. Carl Jung, believe it or not, I'm not the first one to say this, like Carl Jung. Um, I wish there was social media then, <laughs> like Carl Jung's Twitter, you know, that would be fascinating to hear, you know, because, um, I think it's like all inventors had this. It was a secret romance with their exploration, you know, that's a, that's a sort of a kind of rhythmic service. That's when the being kind of re realizes that they have lived for the self to such a degree where now what the wor the world's voice is being heard you know it's like after you handle your own suffering you'll be like oh shit the whole world's here too you know <laughs> 
So it's uh <laughs> that means it's like suffering. At least the good thing is that because it's internal. I mean, I think at least even if we get rid of all the spiritual notions, all metaphysical ideas. Okay, where's where's the intelligence for the physical happening? And we're saying it's happening within the brain through neural activity. You know, a sort of chemical reactions are leading to these sentences. I'm saying, for example, you know. <laughs> But the whole idea is that it's occurring within. It's as if data is coming through your eyes and these photons, as they kind of somehow neurologically, they translate. They translate into stories of myth, the wonder of myth as well. So the thing is, is there has always been just, um, just it's as if like all of history will be explained much clearer if people just considered how the subjective realm was uh, coming into the phase. The subjective evolution is behind, by the way. So what I mean is like, we are living as civilized people right now. And physically, let's say we are, we're civilized, there's nothing uh, going on unnecessarily. Then, it, but our minds are still savage. Do you see art? Like, just like how our ancestors back in the day, they had to be armed because and like people were savage and they could, you could have died any day. Do you know? So now that part is gone. There's civility, but psychologically, the subjective realm is behind. The subjective re realm has not updated to the, uh, the PC that may arise objectively, you know? It's kind of like how Karl Marx felt when he realized that the failure of communism was that people were not, for example, ready. They didn't have a decent enough character. That What that means is some ideas landed on this planet too soon. So they became part of the chaos of history, you know? <laughs> And here's the, here's the very fascinating thing, that whether the human being does a good action or a bad action, both of it require imagination. Both of it require projection of the self's kind of dynamic movement, how the attention is going to continue walking, you know? The issue is that if the intellectual approach doesn't find an authentic opening, it will enter uh, it, not, it will enter an infinite loop, and in that infinite loop, it will wonder how to get out of it, not realizing it requires it's like you have to get out of a dream inside a dream. So it's like one ultimate path of reverse engineering, you know in regards to how ideas have layered to kind of become a sort of lens of looking at the world for you. Dylan Thomas, his father was passing away. Let me see if I can find the exact thing. Dylan Thomas, don't go gentle into that good night. So this is him. Um, okay, I'm going to attempt this. It's a long poem. <laughs> but uh, so here's the situation. Dylan Thomas's father is on his deathbed. And this Dylan Thomas lived from 1914 to 1953. So keep that in mind. 1914 to 1953. Like this guy passed away in the 1950s. You know, he didn't see beyond there. <clears throat> so Dylan Thomas says... To his father, do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Though wise men at their end know dark is right, because their words had forked no lightning, they do not go gentle into that good night. Good men, the last wave by, crying how bright their frail deeds might have danced in a green bay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. 
wild men who caught and sang the sun in flight and learn too late they grieved it on its way do not go gentle into that good night grave men near death who see with blinding sight blind eyes could blaze like meteors and be gay rage rage against the dying of the light and you my father there on the sad height curse bless me now oh, okay curse bless me now <laughs> bless me now with your fierce tears i pray do not go gentle into that good night rage rage against the dying of the light and those two last sentences guys is the same approach and attitude we require that raging against the dying of the light is wanting during our temporary life to wonder about the unknown there is no greater inspiration the world has to move in accordance to action and then dimensions open up you have to live for the uh, live for life to live for life you know <laughs> So Carl Jung says, um, unless you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. So that's the thing. It's, it's, it's no longer man just trying to go beyond the clouds of his uh, outer reality. But it's time for man to wonder about uh, the, the clouds of the inner reality, the thoughts, the axioms, the beliefs, the various ways that language has come and become a part of your world and you never noticed it. This freedom of observing objectivity and even being able to observe subjectivity like objectivity, once your mind can do both, you can look at an object and be aware of its subjective reality and meaning for you. And you can look at a subject and be aware that it can one day become objective, like the thought of a light bulb for Edison became suddenly objective. The inventor was conscious of the subjective and was like pulling, uh, was, was extracting design by the will to um, <laughs> uh, enter the unknown. But in accordance to um, their presence, that means you got to hear the voice of your presence first. All those human beings that animals freak out. <laughs> so what that means is the moment you think you're a thought, it's like you've taken this chunk of clay and shaped it the way you want. And you're like, yay, this is me. But as nature goes on and you live the, your days on this planet, you take uh, or you run laps around the sun, you'll realize this clay will change. It's context, it's world, everything will change. Look at yourself 10 years uh, before, you know? It's like, this is, this is very fascinating. You had a completely different physical existence, you know? And you also had a completely different subjective existence because you, had, you, you, had, you went through so many experiences. So what does that mean? You're neither the objective which is changing, you're neither the subjective which is changing. What are you? And that's when the question and the answer, the moment they find each other, there's a supernova explosion into the instantaneous. The here and now is no longer a concept. It is where the concept is standing. And that's the simplicity of this presence. The simplicity of it is the liberating factor. You're not, you're not being given paradise on a plate. <laughs> you know, paradise is not like a cheesecake, you know? You can't... <laughs> that's not the kind of heaven that I find people should look for. The heaven they should look for should be this idea, this context of that it's not... It's like earth is in heaven. The paradise becomes the subconscious. So it's a way where behind your eyes, the world is no longer at war. And that silence is it. It's, it's, it's experience. Experience is so dynamic. It's like somebody, you know, having only the Wikipedia, you know, who's read the Wikipedia, a Wikipedia article on skydiving and somebody who's actually skydived. It's like, think of the experience. 
Think of the state of the mind as it goes through the experience. So the state of the mind suggests how the world is in a certain state, uh, state or how it's stated even. Now, we can say the multidimensionality, this parallel selfhood that I'm speaking, it's, it's like the same kind of parallel selfhood, um, the parallel uh, viewpoint that we see in having a concept that can be translated in many languages. As if, this, if we took this last sentence of Dylan Thomas, rage, rage against the dying of the light, we took that. And translated it translated that in many different languages the concept transcends the language the language is a degree of seeing that concept so believe it or not um, you can live on this planet with your mind and uh, constantly associating with a fixed character. You can have moments where you're oscillating between a singular experience of a moment and a parallel experience of a moment. And the state of the mind has to be readjusted. That means culture has an artificial interpretation of the mind. It's not real the way people think about the mind because they're still trying to conceptually engage it. But it's, it's only pierced, the veils of thought are only pierced through experience. And that experience is not from a conceptual, it's not, it's like, it's, it, the rational, rationality is in the passenger seat. And irrationality is also in the passenger seat. What is directing it is the presence of nature as the person. <laughs> I remember I was in Iran and I, I was giving this talk, um, like it was the first time I actually uh, gave a talk with a microphone, you know, and uh, <laughs> and I remember I told people that you should go into nature, and then I we clarified that statement by telling them it doesn't mean you should necessarily go in to somewhere where there's trees. It means that you should just you are a part of nature too, so you are be basking in your nature, as if there was a glow to your existence that only you could see. Okay, guys, I'm going to uh, pay attention to the chat now. I was on a different page. Um, Okay, um, you know, uh, Idris, I was reading your comment about, um, I'm going to read that actually, it's an interesting comment. You say, but in every part of the universe, there would be an observer. And if they communicated with each other, with each other nothing would remain unknown. Power collects and maintains knowledge this way. Okay, uh, <laughs> first of all, like a very, I, I like the architecture of kind of like the way you've written the sentences, power collects and maintains knowledge this way. Okay, so here's the thing. Let's, let, let, let's say if Carl, Carl Jung was in the room, he would say there is a personal unconscious and a collective unconscious. The collective unconscious is literally a part of the unknown 
that is so beyond the language threshold that you can't do anything about it. Literally, it doesn't matter what opinion you have on it. It is so unknown, it cannot be known. It's kind of like in yin yang. In the material universe, there is something that is literally not material. As if in the, in, in the shamanic spirit world, if you took the same idea, it would be as if like you're an individual in a world, uh, in, beyond other side of the veil, maybe you're a world inside an individual, you know? You know, um, it's kind of like just in some strange way, respecting um, the presence of the unknown in the moment in the same way that the person respects the concept of space that is holding matter. So externally, we can say it's like, okay, it appears like empty space, but behind your eyes, it's not just the spatial thing. It's, it's, it's just pure unknown. That means it is non-local. That means we, the human being can experience um, being a field of intelligence as if a drop in a river suddenly, but previously it was a drop. Imagine a raindrop falling into a river. In one dimension, it is a singular. There is literally no meaning in another dimension. Its meaning is everything, you know? So what that means is in accordance to what the moment wants to do, the mind can choose. That means the issue of, you can even say the importance of ethics, a sort of ethical existence, where our civility is based on an eth uh, eth you can say ethics pretty much means you acknowledge the law. You acknowledge the need for a sort of value to be kept. For example, something I, Ooh, it's going to take me a couple of years probably to finish, but it's this series of books I'm writing called The Pillars of Civilization. And the Pillars of Civilization are ideas of certain values, certain subjective territories that whether the human being chooses to entertain a, a good or bad archetype, they must protect. <laughs> you know, there's a... Uh, yeah, Idris, I agree with you. But it's strange, you know, it's because it's not all like if we were all clones, like we like this is the thing, right? This is why we have to treat it like, especially street speech, um, starting off with the respect to the inner dimensions of every person. And then we, we would like kind of like the school of Athens where language was a domain. It was literally like a gladi subjective gladiator arena you know, where conception was fighting over the validity upon the objective, you know? It's, um, it's, it, you can say the school of Athens when philosophers debated, that was the first time that people were experiencing a video game, a virtual reality video game, but of su subjective, you know, orientation, you know? <laughs> Something important about the unknown is that it also has to come to you. So that means it's like when you find a moment of, uh, when you can find a moment you trust, it's kind of like you have found a view of the world that you can give freedom to for it to happen on its own. In some of my earlier talks, I spoke about uh, a new renaissance that will occur. 
but this renaissance will be new because it will be the first time it will be a multi-dimensional renaissance in my science fiction novel, I considered it in phases, and in the second phase of it, I defined it as like literally if 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 <laughs> like in my science fiction novel, there's nine parallel realities that the beings are aware of, you know, and so it's like literally a renaissance of not just two people in two different parts of the same location, but uh, it's as if two beings in two different worlds having the same intention, you know. And so this notion of a multidimensional renaissance would be that the renaissance, you can say, started from an outside effort, but this is an inner renaissance occurring. And in the inner renaissance, the character of the being is no longer just reacting in, in, in like loopholes in regards to the past data it was given, the past conception, the past ideology. It's as if you stop chewing the past like gum and you relax you know you spit out the past <laughs> oh my god as if the past is like like a child's eating the wrong thing and the parents are shouting at the child spit it out you know <laughs> spit out the past you know the past that's past I think it's um, sometimes when I reach like the edge of a thought I can't see any further, I wonder about, it's like you either change the self or change the world, or you witness their simultaneous movement. You access the inner eagle vision. The inner eagle vision is not like, <laughs> like that video game Assassin's Creed or whatever. This idea of eagle vision is very simple. It's just the notion that the eagle can land on a branch or it can observe the whole forest from the sky. And it has to do with being reacquainted with the presence of the observer. The presence of the observer is really something that um, you, you ex re ex acceptance is very key, but you have to consciously notice when it was some things that enter the domain of your direct experience you'll instantly know what to do many things that you indirectly experience becomes become tend to become mainly questions you know and so we we think of it this way that um direct experience is in the dimension of the is in the objective realm and indirect uh experience is in the domain of the subjective realm And our relationship with our language is our relationship with the world. As Ludwig Wittgenstein said, the limits of my language are the limits of my world. You see, I, that's what I noticed. So anytime I am, like I remember, especially when I went to Iran and kind of gave that talk, some people asked me and I told them it's like, You awaken to the heartbeat of the unknown, and that means you respect the whole moment as uh, your presence. So it becomes something where, like when you suddenly see phenomena, it doesn't have a subjects don't instantly enter the object, don't embody the object. You simply watch as is. This, this as is, this is, is so ridiculous. It's, it's, it's literally kind of Lao Tzu saying action through inaction. That's the Tao. It means that you understand balance means that you, don't, you really can't ha have an allegiance to one. <laughs> 
it's like you know the good can't understand the concept of good if the concept of bad wasn't there you can say a good person thinks about bad things more than a bad person who thinks about good things you know <laughs> it's like you know if the person thinks they're good 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 i'm good i'm good and that good is based on a sort of subjective filter a sort of belief of a value sometimes we get shocked by how we have changed as people do you know it's literally like um uh, the an image of the sense of the who the person was is in their the person thinks they're an image years of life pass by and they snap out of it realizing they weren't that image and they never were you know it's too life is too dynamic you know Okay, guys, I'm just trying to figure out what you guys are saying. <laughs> it's guys, it's I feel it's kind of like asking um, if there was a truth, if, if, you know, uh, where would it be received, right? And the whole point is concepts are fingers pointing to something. They're never the ultimate thing. Language is... Uh, I'm not promoting language worship, you know. Really, this is the thing. It, it can't be told. It can't be told. It's not, it's, it's, um, the same mindset that a person on an island has in regards to using as many resources possible, trying to find as many tools, you know, it's the same mindset to I feel to have towards ideological truth. It's a separation. I, I had a more profound, in quotation, spiritual experience uh, by separating, noticing I am not my subjective realm than any sort of everything for itself for so long. But it's awake, you know, and, and kind of like how Rabindranath Tagore says, bird is... Um, oh my God, let me find it. <laughs> I think this is worth sharing. I'm just Googling Tagore bird quote. <laughs> Let's see how, if it comes up. Yeah. Faith is the bird that, that feels the light when the dawn is still dark. That means it's like the psychological state can reach the darkest hour, but then just like the yin yang symbol, dawn will come, you know. We are experiencing suffering in our conscious waking state and also realizing there is so much more unknown. And we have been so oriented, our civilization, our economy. I, I, if, like, I, I wish that somehow um, the economical system and the educational system could unify instantly. That means the, way, the easiest way to keep kids in school is to uh, pay them for their assignments. <laughs> and so it's it, because that way they, they seek knowledge to the eventually it's like, how, I don't know how to say it, but it's like there is a sort of flame that we have to keep alive, which is the explorer's inspiration. And the explorer's inspiration only happens when you feel the world has lied to you. That means you, you notice your limitation and that's why you kind of like chess you again, you wait for life to make the move, you know? <laughs>
Okay, guys. Sorry about that. I had to take an intermission there. So, anyways, guys, I, I the whole concept behind this episode was pretty much me trying to share how uh, we as human beings are reaching such a sophisticated level of being aware of communication that we can subjectively maneuver between these parallel selves once we realize we're not thoughts. Thought is a room we enter. There is a war of language going on. This war of language requires either the language to change or the nature of the user of language, the user of this inner technology to change. The user of the inner technology can change easier. They can choose to step into the vehicle, step out of the vehicle, use the vehicle, maneuver in many ways, uh, communicate the world to themselves in, in many ways. But um, <clears throat> at some point, uh, the higher mind seeks service, service after self-actualization. So when you actually reach the uh, epitome of your conscious selfhood, you dismantle. The concepts return to the void. The idea of you returns to the void that all reality subjectively stepped out of. In that void, there is the witness that begins to move. As the witness moves, the movement of the witness is on some level the unconscious mind. So the faith becomes to the inner movement of moving on its own. That When your attention goes into that state, it's becoming slowly space. It's not rather a kind of Casper ghost leaving the body. Yo, I'm out of body. <laughs> It, it, it's an idea where the texture of the attention is changing the quality. Pretty much the being is becoming their moment. So it's as if you were first something in the room, being aware of the room. Now imagine you're becoming the space in the whole room aware of what's in. So what that means is you're you are, you are spatial and the unknown is moving your spatial intelligence. <clears throat> and that's simply because your, your attention is not on uh, time. <laughs> The grand question comes, what is the point of human life? Why? Why is, why is a pebble in a light beam kind of, why has a rock, why is a rock spinning in the middle of nowhere around the sun that will die just like we will? So it's an opportunity of a design pretty much. So that means all stories, all stories that human beings have generated, they will go back to this. They will go back to the empty page where there is a sort of waiting. I don't know how to say it. It's kind of like you, we were in the dimension of three, we went to the dimension of two, then we went to the dimension of one, then we went to zero. When we went to the dimension of zero, there was no dimension. There was no zero. There was nothing. And then from the dimension of the zero, the unknown will. When I say the unknown will, that means uh, you got to sometimes let the cosmos drive the moment. <laughs> <clears throat> it's pretty much all about trusting your mind. That's the whole point of all these the new age synchronicity phenomena the telepathy all this all this the point of it is just to find a mirror of a moment you can trust to be able to see the true nature of this phenomena you're calling mind <clears throat> many things are in the moment are intelligent on their own 
the, this world is like that. This is why it's so important to study your ecosystem. Laws came into place through the experience of various environments. Various journeys were made uh, for civilization to look the way it is. So what it is, is we're kind of returning back to a state of looking at the world before we storified it. So it's just nature. And then we realize we can revalue, um, uh, reimpose thought if need be. Okay, guys, um, uh, I wanted to just share one story and then probably um, if nobody has any questions or anything, I'm, I'm teen. it was in the UK, I, was, I would have this kind of common bench, I would go sit and record these talks. It was in the yard of this uh, accommodation place. And uh, the experience of that was it was like 2 a.m. and the gates of it was open to the street and it, there was this moment I had where suddenly it was like I was giving the talk and then I felt my whole moment. So the way I, I it's like literally my, the, my experience of my space changed. Like if you could imagine the moment was a giant sphere around me. It was as if this giant sphere suddenly moved out of where I was. And in that moment, I suddenly had this feeling of just instantly ending the talk, getting up and going. And I noticed there was a sort of... I don't know if it was a fight or something. It was some, some, something chaotic was happening in that environment, you know, something sketchy, you know. And so it was, a, it was a moment where it was like I was engaged, my ego, everything was engaged. Uh, my sense of self in that moment, subjective self was engaged with giving the talk, but suddenly my moment moved. And when my moment moved, it was that was the kind of parallel self. It was literally like the, the mind protecting its body, you know as the environment you know it was like literally i felt nature's it was like literally nature telling me all right and to end the talk you know <laughs> and multi multi-dimensionality it's worth it i mean like you got to treat the phenomena that your mind generates as feedback of what it is this is why i'm uh such a huge advocate of writing. I think uh, it doesn't get more divine than writing. <laughs> so anyways, guys, um, if anybody wants to challenge something, I'd say I said in this talk, I'd be interested in hearing it.
Okay. <laughs> Let me see how I would challenge my own thoughts. You know, there's a, in chess, there's a way where you train, where you, you play as the white pieces and you make the best move possible. Then you turn around and kind of look at, play the best pieces and make the best move possible. So you're challenging your own best move. So, um, uh, so I guess to this would be that, um, if the mind, if the subjective realm appears elusive, is an illusion, doesn't that only leave objectivity as the source of divinity? Or let me see how else I can approach it. Why is there a need for an awareness to parallel senses of self? I think it's because we're headed that way. People have a digital self of themselves online. It, people who write diaries, I mean, I, I personally don't write diaries because... Um, it's worth writing a book. <laughs> it's like there's more important stuff to write, you know? But, uh, <laughs> I think it's because, um, it's the, we're reaching the peak. So, so what does that mean, Idris? <laughs> yeah, I mean, sure, but you can also um, challenge. What that means is, um, uh, what is what, you see, no two people see the same thing, you know? So what is, in what way do you agree? <laughs> You agree with the unknown, the fact that it just reaches a point where we can't literally discuss it, it's too dynamic to experience. I mean, I found it kind of hilarious, you know, it's like, I was like, when, when I heard that there was scientific claim of <laughs> like parallel dimension theory, it was like, like the notion that there's parallel realities. I kind of found it hilarious because ancient cultures also acknowledged parallel realities, but they storified them, you know? So the thing is, we are getting more strict as a civilization, more precise, you can say, about how language is being the self. So this whole thing about political co correction in the West, it's happening because there's a new effort of expression occurring through language. L language is finding, uh, look at how much the civilization has kept people starved. It's keeping people starved of uh, collective value. 
The thing is, I think because we're temporary beings, we always wonder about what we leave behind. And what we leave behind stretches from uh, many things, but eventually how the actions kind of had a momentum to go towards the direction. So at most I find any time when people speak for a second, we have stepped out of the bunk. We, are, we have kind of stepped out of the battlefield of subjectivity into a, just a simple moment to wonder about it all, you know. Okay, guys, um, let me just, um, all right, nice. Okay, so I'm going to say um, Miranda to, uh, for simpler, uh, for simpler way of saying it. I mean, you say that this age of technology is quite literally nothing short of amazing. I'm not sure how the world would react to the things uh, what conclusion did you make of language? Kind of, it's like metamorphosis into just nature's movement. Was it that the subjective laws broke into something uh, that was more superiorly defined? Interesting. And uh, Miranda, how was the how did you how do you define the metaphysical, like the negation of the physical? Oh, so genetically designed to. Uh, can you explain the, your last sentence? Oh, kind of like there's unknown patterns uh, to how we genetically open our eyes to the world, kind of. Is it kind of like the storehouse of impressions of a field of intelligence? I'm curious to know. Uh, I'm following you, Miranda. Um, yes, we are a symbolic creature, but where's... Yeah, okay, let's see. Mm -hmm. Interesting, Idris. I, I, I think the thing is that if we are a symbolic creature... 
what is the value of that symbol? How should we interpret the value of our symbolic existence? Uh, Miranda, if you, I, I'm very fascinated to know your opinion. All right, guys, um, I want to share one last quote, and uh, I feel we have reached um, our destination. <laughs> um, Rabindranath Tagore says, I slept and dreamt that life was joy. I awoke, and I saw that life was service. I acted, and behold service was joy i feel the unknown is a call to a sort of strange service but this service is one where the person's thirst for the self the individual self has sufficed and then they are beginning to for for the first time the effort of the inner self to identify with the collective archetype which means to for them for the first time just like the mind of the child animated the teddy bear into kind of like a personality now the mind of man is animating the story of civilization do you see in its mind it's a, it's becoming a collective archetype where the value of the self is uh codependent you know it's dependent on other the other you know it's like um A collective call to a sort of inner action. <laughs> we 
There has been moments, believe it or not, where I've playfully animated the Lords of Karma. Like I've had conversations with the Lords of Karma, kind of. My mind had playfully kind of like the external circumstance was very unnecessary. I felt to my inner reality. And so it was as if my, from, from an inner, from a, in a playful abstract way, I, I had kind of personified uh, the circumstance, animated it into a certain way. And I was playfully kind of like questioning the moment, you know, to some degree when the subjective reality becomes void, there's no opinion, no emotion. When the subjective reality becomes filled with various, uh, becomes a hierarchical, then there is a hierarchy of emotions in a spectrum, you know. So it's like in a, based on how you are using the technology, there's an advantage or a disadvantage, you know, and that's mainly uh, based on where. You know, I in the film, kind of X Men in the comic. There is a character called Storm that can control the weather. And it was very interesting because I thought, how would her inner reality be when, like, you know, her eyes would become white and like weather would change it. it it's as if her she was actualizing her imagination, you know. That means as if the world she saw behind the weather she saw behind her eyes was the she can change the external reality, listen to her inner reality, you know. We have to return to a sort of um, um, a sort of class system of honor, but honor in accordance to vision. There's, um, even though I said that last thing, <laughs> but I guess I'm, the flow's coming back. I'll just share this one more, one more story. Um, it's the story of the Tower of Babylon and how all human beings gather together. All human beings were united under one language and started to build this next level tower to the heavens where the gods stood, you know, to the clouds where the gods stood. Eventually, the structure was being built so well because all human beings were united by one language. And that's another way of saying they were seeing the same world. You know, we are citizens of one world, but we each see our own world in that one world. So there's a sort of massive fragmentation. We have to climb out of our own subjectivity to even be able to see the real world, you know. <clears throat> so anyways, in this in this situation, people are united under one language. It's humanity uh, has found its flag and its fla flag is the story it, it tells itself. Okay, um, so to continue, um, <laughs> this tower is being built to the heavens. The gods see that man is climbing up to the elevated, to, as man is attempting to his own ascension. 
and one god comes to throw lightning and then there's a more relaxed god who says hey man no 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 wait let me show you how it's done you know <laughs> and then the this god what he does is he he makes he breaks that one language that all these humans were united and he makes all human beings speak different languages you see he fragments he divides and conquers it's like the divine will divide divided and conquered that initiative of man do you know and uh, so this is, so the situation happens where human beings no longer speak the same language, so they are no longer unified. Do you know? They are they can't communicate. They can't build the tower anymore, and that's the story of the Tower of Babylon. And strangely, we find kind of like that's how our world is today. It is divided up, but it has a totally different uh, kind of story route to it. You know, so. Um, this fragmentation eventually it will lead to one common language and that language is kind of strangely we're getting glimpses of it for example comedy you know one one joke is is universal for example do you see it's like certain actions that the whole collective sees they embrace do you know this will lead to this language where it's no longer a language of an out al with an alpha alphabet it's a language of rhythmic abidance it is it is the winds of evolution moving freely. <clears throat> so anyways, guys, thanks uh, for sharing. Uh, that's the end of the story. Um, rise, mankind, rise. <laughs>